and we have no conflict of interest uh, to, uh, to declare. So this is the lab, and I'd like to thank, particularly I'll start by just thanking the people in the lab who did most of the work. So Leora Witkowski is a PhD student who's just finishing uh, her PhD uh, seminar is actually next week. Uh, Leanne de Kock did most of the work I'll be talking about today, as well as Mona Wu. They're all three of them are PhD students in my lab. So the outline uh, for this talk is about DICER. What is it? What is it? What does it do? And I'm going to talk about germline mutations in DICER being associated with a, a novel syndrome that some of you have heard about, as you just mentioned, but others will maybe not know so much about. And I'm going to talk about the specific somatic mutations occurring in the tumors uh, of carriers and how they're different from the germline mutations. And I'll talk a little bit, not much, about mechanisms and then we'll conclude. So this is what uh, DICER looks like in a very sort of cartoony kind of way. It was first discovered in, uh, in the worm, C. elegans, and essentially for the purposes of this talk, it you can regard it as a processor of, micro of microRNA precursors. So it takes, f it takes it from a precursor to a mature microRNA, which is then uh, acts as a regulator of mRNA. And it's very important for development, uh, and knockout of DICER seems to be lethal at the embryonic stem cell stage. And we know that subtle changes in microRNAs um, actually seem to underlie an enormous number of developmental processes. You can look up you know, sort of microRNA and anything, you know, depression, uh, diabetes, uh, dementia, um, whatever. You'll see that there's some link has been published. So in, in terms of conservation, what's very interesting, this is plant, this is a mammal, this is a fly, this is C. elegans, and you'll, you'll see that these domains are extremely well conserved and particularly focus on the RNH 3A and 3B, and you'll see that all species have the same 3A and 3B configuration, which obviously is important, and I'll be talking about 3A and 3B, particularly 3B, RNH 3B, quite a bit. So there's 3B here. This is the structure of human DICER. There's the 3A region. These are the exons. This is what the protein looks like a little bit anyway. Helicase here, pass. In fact, this is, I'll show you, this is actually slightly inverted now, but anyway, the structure, here's the five and the three prime with the loop there, and then DICER comes along, acts as a ruler, and then cuts uh, into these three components. And I'll show you that, how that works, but this is the 3B, encoded by exons 24 and 25, and they are the ones that seem to control this 3P, 5P process. And there's 3A and 3B next to each other, actually, as it were, on the, uh, on the, uh, um, on the actual uh, pr precursor structure. Okay, so this is what it looks like now. It's thought in, this is work done by Ian McRae. It's thought to have this structure rather like a sort of a homunculus with a head here and then a body and an arm pointing out towards you. So that's the 3D structure with the um, RNAs 3A and 3B here and the, the, the PAS domains uh, up at the top. And that's the ruler function uh, to cut the, uh, cut the microRNAs. So in 2014, what we knew was that, the, was that while germline mutations were scattered along the gene, somatic mutations really clustered in the 3B region. There were, there were six cases of LOH seen only in pituitary blastoma and pineoblastoma. Uh, but really, the, what was interesting was the germline mutations were scattered along the gene, whereas the somatic mutations were generally clustered in just these two regions. So a very different pattern to that seen in the germline. What's happened since then? Well, essentially, more of the same. We've added a lot more. This is all the known mutations published uh, in the literature uh, as of January. So many more germline mutations have been added. Uh, more somatic mutations have been added, but in, in general, they've all been added, again, at the same region. So there's something very interesting going on, such that the somatic mutations are only really occurring in this region. So again, this is what happens. So here's the transcription. Here's the, here's the primary microRNA, which is then processed by Drosia into a precursor microRNA, which is then transported by exporting into the cytoplasm. And then here's the five and the three and the, the hook or the loop. And then that loop is then processed by DICER into these two uh, 5P and 3P microRNAs taken, out by the, uh, taken up by the uh, RNA inhibitory, uh, RNA silencing complex, which then binds to microRNA and silences. If this match is perfect, it's a, it completely silences the mRNA. If the match is imperfect, it, it down, sort of down-regulates it. 
Okay, so I think I sort of mentioned this. The other point is a lot of redundancy that you know, many micronase may, may affect one transcript and one transcript may be modified by many micronase. So it's sort of a redundant system, if you like. So this was the key event, really, in sort of, uh, that got me interested in this area, was this paper uh, showing that Dyson mutations were found in children with pleuropulmonary blastoma, which is a very, very rare lung tumor. It's, it's you know, it's, it's often seen, you know, sort of a few cases a year in most, in most countries. Um, there's only been about four or 500 cases ever reported, and most of them have been collected by the registry uh, in Minnesota. And most are diagnosed before age six. So if you see a pleuropulmonary blastoma in somebody age 10, it probably is not a pulmonary, pleuropulmonary blastoma. But it was known to be associated with the tumor syndrome for some years by work done by Jack Priest and others. And it was really when the linkage came to 14Q, the team were able to work out that DICE was a likely candidate because it mapped to that region and they found mutations in uh, children with PPBs. And this was published in Science uh, seven years ago. So the, the key point is that these, these cysts start off as they're benign looking but actually malignant cysts with, and then they become solid and then they become completely solid. And this progression seems to uh, happen uh, over time, uh, such that the mean ages, as you see here, are older uh, as you go from the benign cyst to the malignant cyst. So here's what they look like, very honeycomb pattern. And the pedigrees, what's interesting about them is the amount of people who have the mutation but don't have the disease. So you'll see here this person's parent, grandparent are unaffected, but this child with a rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, which is clearly related, uh, has the mutation. And over here there's assisted nephroma. So there's many, many cases of non-penetrance which is obviously is probably why it took a while to, to find the syndrome, because one case over here you might not recognize as part of this family. And as I mentioned, specific mutations have been identified in these hotspot regions, and they're particularly common in Cetolulidic cell tumors, which I'll come on to later, but also seen in rhabdomyosarcomas. And there they are here, picked up in the hotspot region. And this is just a sort of blown up version showing that they these hotspot regions, which I showed you earlier, are actually metal uh, iron binding domains uh, for manganese and magnesium. And this is what we found, was there are hotspot mutations on one allele and a truncating mutation on the other allele. Where, where it could be assessed, they were always in trans. They were never seen in cis, suggesting that these the, this is the sort of equivalent of the two hit phenomena. But what's interesting, of course, is the two hit usually the idea is you take out the other allele completely. You either lose a bit of DNA, or you get, a, you get a recombination event, or you get reduplication, or something like that, but you don't actually get a point mutation occurring on the other allele as, as a usual mechanism. Uh, it's mentioned here, but it's really generally regarded as an inactivating point mutation. So this is a sort of slightly uh, a twist on the, on the classical uh, tumor suppressor model. And the idea is that if 20% of all mutations occur uh, at one position, then it's an oncogene. If 20% occur uh, scattered across the gene, then it's a tumor suppressor gene. So obviously, on the one hand, it's an oncogene. On the other hand, it's a tumor suppressor. And this was, it, but it was known that this processing center, shown here, here's, here, are the, here are the domains in 3A, 3B and 3A, were important for the, uh, for the creation of uh, mature micronase before actually the gene was known uh, to, to, to cause cancer, or any of these mutations were known to be important. This actually predates it by some time. So the phenotypes I'm going to talk about now are really the, the ones involved in endocrinology, and I'll focus on pituitary blastoma, MNG, uh, and uh, differential thyroid cancer, and ovarian sex cord stromal tumors. So we'll start with um, first of all with thyroid nodules, which had been noted from this paper here from 2009 to be seen in children with PPBs, but because they were common, it wasn't quite clear whether this is related to the phenotype or not, but they were seen in actually 10 families. And of course, as you know, goiter is a very common disorder, so it could be that it was felt to be simply, you know, these children had goiter, or the parents had goiter, it wasn't certain that it was related to dicer itself. Um, uh, these are the typical colored nodules just taken from uh, the literature. Um, but this is an example of a family with uh, rather different appearances from Marta Corbinitz uh, from the UK, where you can see what's striking is that the age of onset is very young. So there's 16, 16, 11, 14. Some of these people haven't yet been tested. It'd be interesting to see whether this woman here, for example, carries a mutation. But you'll see the mutations is tracking in the family. 
and the age of onset, so very young, this has a Dyson mutation shown here, whereas this family from Belgium, similarly impressive, uh, goiter and goiter in three individuals, but they're all old onset, and this family does not have a Dyson mutation. So the key point is MNG occurring in a familial setting uh, in, in children, it, one should think of Dyson. The other thing we noticed from this paper, which was published, as I say, by Jack Priest, was that he, they saw an association with cetulioledic cell tumors. And when you go back to the literature, as often you find uh, somebody got there first, and this is a paper from uh, uh, Joe Fraumany, as in Lee and Fraumany, uh, and uh, this was showing that, in fact, cetulioledic cell tumors was already known to be linked to uh, thyroid goiter or thyroid adenoma in 1974, but it wasn't until this family came along uh, and we published in 2011, so the black is people with the goiter and the SLCT is arrowed, you'll see that we found three families. Um, this one was from uh, Canada, this one was from um, uh, Marek Nidzela in, in Poland, and this family actually was from Montreal, where uh, the, the woman had both goiter and SLCT. So all three had mutations in DISA. So it was very clear to us at that point that SLCT and goiter occurring together is a pretty much a, a hallmark feature of DISA. If you see somebody with a cetulioledic cell tumor who comes to you as an endocrinologist because of um, uh, androg androgen uh, symptoms, then obviously uh, think about the, the question of whether there might be an, a, 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 a DISA mutation, particularly if it's an early onset case. We don't quite know what, what the upper age limits. We've seen cetulioledic cell tumor in a, DISA, in a DISA carrier in a person in their 50s, but they're usually younger than that. So obviously if you see this in a child or an adolescent, uh, then you need to think about DISA. In fact, other sex called stromal tumors are seen in DISA syndrome, such as ovarian cetulioledi cell tumors, glenandroblastomas, and juvenile granulosa cell tumors, but these have all been reported pretty much at the case report level. This is the PubMed ID, uh, which I can, I can send you these slides if you're interested uh, to tell you how to find this paper, but this is a paper that shows, yes, these occur, but they're all kind of one case. And of course, they can produce symptoms of our hormone secretions, so again, they might come to you as an endocrinologist. And this is our study of somatic mutations, and you'll see here that when we looked in an unbiased way at as many ovarian and testicular gonadal tumors as we could find, we found that really only the cetulioledic cell tumors had frequent mutations. There was nothing else in the set called stromal tumors. There was just one here in an unclassified. It was probably a cetulioledic cell tumor. And in fact, now we think that if you have an unclassified sex called tumor, you should do dietary analysis because if you find a mutation, it's probably an SLCT, not an odd uh, granulosa cell tumor. Germ cell tumors, in, 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 we found a few somatic mutations. And again, we found some in testicular tumors. We've never actually seen germline mutations in people with germ cell tumors, having said that. We've only seen somatic mutations. But again, it might be helpful in, in making a differential diagnosis. And just showing that these mutations were, again, all in these metal binding domains. Uh, so they, it does seem to be a, 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 a repeating phenomena that the mutations only seem to occur in these uh, specific domains of the RNH3B region of DISA. And there's just an example of the mutation here. Here's the germline. Here's the somatic mutation. And again, they're all clustering to 3B here. This is a SLCT. What about um, goiter? Uh, and thyroid cancer, can they both occur? So we, we knew that goiter could because we published that paper, but we weren't sure about thyroid cancer. Again, it wasn't in the original description. It wasn't in the, 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 the pediatric uh, pulmonology paper I showed you. But we thought, well, you know, there were a couple of cases that we came come across. So we began to look at these and collect the, collect the samples. This is a paper we published in um, JCM a few years ago. This is the three different germline mutations, three different cases, and all of them had somatic mutations in the 3B domain uh, that I showed you earlier. So we felt very sure that these three um, differential thyroid cancers were all caused by DICE mutations. Interestingly, all cases had been exposed either to radiotherapy, bone marrow transplantation, high dose chemo, because it all had pituitary blast, um, pleuropulmonary blastomas. So we wondered whether the chemo, you know, that might be an accentuating fact of exposure to radiotherapy. But then this paper came along, which is a single family, um, which was published earlier this year, I believe, uh, where there was really no evidence for any exposure to radiation. So they called it a direct association. It's, this, it's one family, 
all with the same Joomla mutation, but with different, uh, or at least one of them is different, uh, somatic mutations seen. So this confirmed that you know, thar differential thyroid cancer is definitely a part of DISA. And in fact, as people now uh, start to look, they're seeing more of it, and we're getting referrals of cases of children with uh, differential thyroid cancer increasingly. What about somatic mutations? in goiter, perhaps you think, well, they're not really tumors, or they're not really certainly not malignant tumors. Would you expect to see these mutations? So we weren't sure about this. So here's a case that we recently published in endocrine-related cancer uh, of a child with an SLCT and a goiter, both age 13. And you'll see here, here's the germline mutation, here's the MNG, and you'll see that there's the germline and there's the somatic mutation. So the goiter actually has a somatic mutation, but you can't tell from this trace whether it's in cis or trans. And of course, everything it tells us, uh, it should be in, in trans, uh, it, but we don't know. It could be in cis. And there's the SLCT with, with a mutation as well. So both tumors have these 3B mutations. When we looked, in fact, we found um, they were again in 3B, and we looked to see whether it was in cis or trans. We found by doing uh, cloning that they were, in fact, were both, uh, they never occurred together. So there, there's one, there's the other, there's wild types and no mutation, but never occurring together, so therefore they must be in trans. So they do seem to occur. We also noticed, we saw these sort of funny little peaks that were wavering along the baseline in a couple of goiters. So we wondered whether there might actually be um, something unusual going on. We thought, well, maybe since goiter is composed of nodules, could there be a distinct sort of architecture to MNG? So we got hold of this example of a dicer related goiter, and we uh, took some biopsies from it. So these two were then pooled, and these two were pooled, and we sequenced uh, by next generation sequencing these but these, these two um, uh, cores, we found a, a dicer mutation in RNH3B at a frequency of 28%. And when we sequenced these uh, two cores together, we found a different dicer mutation at a frequency of 41%. So these two nodules are comp contain different 3B mutations, the same germline mutation, but different 3B mutations. And of course, if we biopsied more regions, which we're planning to do, I would suspect that we will find more <coughs> 3B, <coughs> 3B mutations of each nodule, if you like, uh, is expressing a different mutation. Uh, and again, they all affect the 3B domain uh, that I ex explained earlier. There are in fact, uh, so, so, one, so two cases had one 3B mutation, uh, five cases had two 3B mutations, and two cases had no 3B mutations. But those two cases, interestingly, w w were from the case I showed you earlier from Belgium where there, were no, where there was no germline mutation. So all cases, in other words, with a germline mutation had at least one 3B mutation, and some, as you see here, had two different mutations in different nodules. So that does suggest something interesting is going on, that each nodule is, as it were, competing with the others to, uh, to produce the, the, the multinodular appearance. So the model we would have was in the normal thyroid, so you get a th when you get a 3B mutation, you get hyperplasia. Sorry, when you get a germline mutation, you get hyperplasia, but no nodules. And then the 3B mutations appear, uh, and they then, so as it were, compete with oncogenic properties and start to compete uh, and produce the multinodularity that we see. And each of these colors is representing a different 3B mutation. So what about pituitary blastoma? This is a rare tumor, uh, as you see here, uh, with staining for cytokeratin, here staining for ACTH, and here standing for key 67, which appears to be variable. I'll show you this uh, in a minute. Uh, so these tumors um, uh, were first described by Scheithauer uh, rec uh, fairly recently, actually, uh, in, the, in Acta Neuropathologica. Here's a P53 stain, again, showing sort of varied staining, uh, not picking up all the cells, but certainly staining some cells positive. This was the first case from 2008 of a child with a pituitary blastoma. The child died. We were unable to study this child, but the child had the classic features of Cushing's disease and diabetes insipidus. The other classic feature is ophthalmoplegia. Those are basically the three things the children present with. But this case came along, and we were able to study this case because the child, fortunately, is living, still living, and interestingly, has a very low um, MIB, uh, or key 67 so the tumor is behaving almost like a benign tumor, but very large. We're not really sure if they are actually malignant tumors. They're tumors, but a lot of these uh, symptoms and signs come from the produ production of ACTH rather than from the tumor itself, it seems. So this child had a germline mutation that's carried by the mother, who appears to be well. 
And this is a case showing that you can have a substantial pedigree. This is a, this child here had a pituitary blastoma age nine. This is from Montreal. But when we extended the pedigree, which hadn't been done at the time, we actually found that there were cases of goiter, cytoliolytic cell tumors, cystic nephromas. Uh, there's a case actually of a Wilms tumor, I think, over here. So there's a cases, many, many other mutations occurring. So the penetrance, again, looks to be fairly low. But why it picks out this child with a, with a pituitary blastoma, of course, nobody knows. This is a recent case, another, rec another case we recently found a mutation in here, another general mutation. Again, inherited from the mother, a child who was obviously uh, uh, obese, had Cushing syndrome, and then here she is a few years uh, later. She's doing uh, okay now. We, we were in touch with her recently. And uh, you can see that here's the general mutation, and again, uh, the typical uh, features of um, uh, Cushing's, uh, uh, Cushing syndrome produced by uh, the CTH. Um, this one's particularly interesting because the mutation, you may recognize it, the mutation's occurring in the 3B domain. So this is a journal mutation, not present in either parent, so probably either a mosaic or a de novo mutation. We weren't able to, to determine that, but it's occurring in the 3B domain. So I showed you that 3B domain mutations are nearly all somatic, but this one's in the germline. And what's very interesting about this case is the child is very severely affected, unfortunately, with lung cysts, renal cysts and a pituitary blastoma, all diagnosed at birth. So an inherited or a germline 3B mutation appears to be much, much more serious than one occurring uh, elsewhere in the gene that, uh, that's, that simply truncates the protein, suggesting for different functions. And we recently showed, in fact, that, that uh, mosaic 3B mutations are actually quite a common cause of multiple primary tumors in children with Dyser syndrome. Just showing you this summary of what we found. So when I presented this in, in, uh, in Florence, we actually had three mutations. Uh, and now, four years later, we actually, each case that we were able to study all tissues has a DICER mutation. So it seems as though that if you have a child with a pituitary blastoma, they have a DICER mutation, either in the germline or somatically. But it seems like all cases we've studied so far. There's two other cases I know about. One was published from Thailand, another one from the, uh, from the NIH group, and I believe they, 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 both those cases have, have DICER mutations. So this just shows you here the, 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 the red is cases where you've got two mutations. Uh, and the blue is when there's, a, uh, where there's a germline mutation and we weren't able to study the somatic or there wasn't a somatic mutation. Uh, and the black is cases where we just didn't, uh, we didn't have enough DNA to do anything. So two cases, we just couldn't, uh, we couldn't be certain. But the others, as you can see, they, nearly, they all have either one or both uh, germline and somatic mutations. And it was published uh, a few years ago now. So just uh, to finish, talking about the functional changes I mentioned. So, uh, so in the original paper uh, that I showed you earlier about 3B mutations from David Huntsman's group, they had shown that mutations in the 3B domain produce a loss here, as you can see, of, um, of uh, 5P micronase shown here, the absence, with these mutations being introduced into, uh, into cell lines. And other groups had also shown that RNA-3A mutations affect 3, 3P production, and RNA-3B mutations produced affect 5P production. So all this was sort of consistent. So we wondered, just shown dramatically, uh, diagrammatically here, here's wild type, that's what you should expect. With the 5P mutant, you don't get full cleavage of the 5. The 3 should be okay. With a 3P mutant, you should get production of the 5, but the 3 won't be produced properly. And if there's no product, then there'll be no micronase. And so we looked at this just to see what, whether the mutations do seem to produce the right kind of character. So here's the uh, wild type here showing the 5 and the 3 being produced at the right size from the precursor shown at the top. And this is an in vitro assay with a pull down. And you can see here, here's 1709 occurring in 3B and it producing this characteristic pattern with a hook here. There's no 5, but 3 is produced normally. And the same for uh, another mutation, which is right next door as you'd expect. 3A mutations also behave as expected. So here's, uh, here's, uh, here's 1320A with the, again, the three with the hook and the five being produced, but no three. But what's interesting is this mutation, which is the only 3A mutation we've ever seen, actually, 
which occurs in a Wilms tumor, what's interesting is it doesn't really behave like a 3A mutation because you'll see here it's the, the three uh, primed um, micronates are being produced at low levels. The fives, though, are not being produced, and there's a five with a hook. So this mutation is sort of behaving in some kind of strange intermediate way, and it's very interesting that it's sort of the only 3A we've ever seen, and it isn't behaving like a classical 3A mutation. So maybe this is in some way behaving more like a 3B mutation. We don't know why that is. It's not actually exactly a metal binding domain, so it may be affecting the folding of the protein, for example. And some mutations seem to have an intermediate effect where they do produce the, the correct ratio of five to three, but it takes much longer, this is two hours, to get anything like uh, the amount you're seeing at 30 minutes. So some of these mutations probably have an effect to do with how long it takes to process the micronage rather than the actual pattern, and also whether this five hook uh, is abnormal and has any contribution, we do not yet know. So. To finish, uh, Dyson mutations were first associated about seven years ago, and we have sort of extended this now to other conditions, particularly the endocrine manifestations, which affect children and, and young adults in the main. The major endocrine manifestations are goiter, with or without differentiated thyroid cancer, sex called stromal tumors, particularly Sertoliolytic cell tumors, and pituitary blastoma. And in hereditary cases, the first germline mutation is often truncating, and it's accompanied by a second, usually missense mutation, nearly always located in the 3B domain. And uh, it, it does seem as though that there are somatic mutations occurring in conditions which are closely related to these conditions. I haven't, I haven't got time to talk about this, but we are finding some diseases that have somatic mutations where we don't see germline mutations in these children. And different mutations, as I showed you, may have a different effect on micronate populations, but what this really means in terms of diseases, we don't yet know. And obviously, research is just commencing in this complicated area. So I'd like to thank uh, the people who did the work, as I showed you at the start of the, uh, the talk. Also, of course, collaborators, funders, uh, Jack Priest and Mark Fabian, who's been helping with the uh, biochemistry. Many collaborators, some of them are in the room. I'd like to thank them uh, one by one, particularly Marek uh, from Poland, who's helped me a lot and was really in at this right from the start. Uh, and Kathy Chung, who is visiting our lab, who's been very supportive and has brought a lot of Australian cases to our attention in Montreal. So I'd like to stop there and thank you very much.